management in environmental medicine. Thank you. First of all, I am not the president of the <laughs> Divo Sano Foundation. I am the director. I am the director. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be with you. And also, I'm happy to be able to participate in this project of Alborada Foundation. And also, I'm very um, happy to be able to contribute um, towards the advancement of um, environmental medicine. Yesterday, yesterday I was um, finishing up my presentation because I had been very busy in the organization of this um, Congress. This is the fifth International Congress um, Environmental Medicine. New diseases, new treatments. New treatments. New diseases, new treatments. We must emphasize that. As Einstein said, if you want to find new results, don't do the same thing always. We are advancing, we're opening new paths, we're proposing new ideas, and I'll be describing a new system by resonance, and perhaps um, you have, hadn't heard about it before, as Dr. Tinao stated. Um, very often, it's very difficult to start opening a new path. And before starting, I would like to just make a, some comments, something that has drawn my attention. 160,000 years ago, the homo, homo sapiens appeared. In the year 1500 before Christ, um, in the year 15,000 BC, toxins were described. We had the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, and here we are today, the Fifth International Congress of Environmental Medicine. But despite that time that has elapsed, we're still the same. How much, however, have our environment changed? How many toxins are we exposed to? Has our body had sufficient time to be able to control or organize those changes? By resonance technique as an element of support for diagnosis and treatment of the environmental medicine. Since I learned about the bioresonance equipment and I started using it, I have discovered its great utility. And I think it's really going to be very interesting. My presentation has the following objective to describe the bioresonance technique as a support to diagnosis and treatment within the scope of integrated medicine established, a theoretical framework, and a scientific justification for the use of the bioresonance technique, and then to describe possibilities in the field of environmental medicine for bioresonance. Integrative medicine proposes overall approach to the patient, conventional medicine plus natural medicine, and the multidisciplinary approach comprised of multidisciplinary team. It takes into account the widest range of um, elements that affect the status of the patient. It is a measurement um, for health. Health, what is health? Not having any limitations? Bioresonance, more therapy. It is an integrated approach for diagnosis and treatment with vibrations, electromagnetic vibrations of the patient. This method was developed in 1977 by, a, by Dr. Morel and E. Rash, an engineer. Mora comes from the names of the doctor and the engineer who designed and developed this system. Let's go back to the past. The traditional Chinese medicine, 2600 BC, electroacupuncture of all, of all, all the way to the present. The traditional Chinese medicine, 2600 BC, uh, perhaps 
um, that even started much earlier. This was based on experience, on observation, and it was an attempt to link and relate person with the environment. It looks at organic, emotional aspects and relationship with the environment. And this is an attempt to fit the individual within the environment. This uh, use certain meridians, there are different studies showing that there is less resist resistance to passage of electrical current in certain paths according to the meridians described by the Chinese so many, many years ago. This is done using um, different needles inserted at different sites. It increased or reduced the flow of that energy. In fact, energy was considered to be water by the Chinese, water that flowed. When the energy flux was established or reestablished, health was recovered. Not against aggression, but the capacity to adapt to the circumstances of that individual. That was what the Chinese were doing in the past, and that is also the underlying rationale of the more approach. Vol's electroacupuncture. After more than 4,000, more than 4,000 years of use of um, Chinese acupuncture, we had the development introduced by Dr. Reinhold Vol. Some of the results that he achieved in conventional med medicine he did not like. So he used, he turned to um, traditional Chinese medicine and so improvement in many of his patients. He got in touch with an engineer, F. Werner, who created a developed device that was capable of measuring, recording the energy potential of the acupuncture points and the corresponding organs. Later on, a system was developed, a simpler system was de developed to regulate the energy of the meridians and the associated organs. In 56, started research work on electroacupuncture. 1961, um, the International Electroacupuncture Medical Society was founded. There was an important repercussion of his studies and received many awards. Very briefly, what we've seen is that there is a relationship between the internal organs and certain acupuncture points. We are able to know the status of the internal organ by measuring the flow, the flux of energy at the site where the need of the needles. We use a measurement device at the site of interest we um, try to cut that flow of energy. To close the energy, the patient takes an electrode on the other side, hand, feet, etc. These um, different points of the meridian are utilized to apply the measurement device to determine the resistance levels also. The point of acupuncture receives a stimulus. We use a battery to charge that, and we add or reduce uh, more energy depending on the level of resistance. In a healthy individual, we have this voltage measurement. The, uh, we determine the median resistance. If resistance increases, then we know that we have a chronic pathology when there's inflammation, just as when inflammation exists. What has been interesting in both studies has been the following. Um, drugs changed measurement. There was no constant measurement when a drug was taken or a homeopathic um, agent was taken. That point of resistance changed. That means that it had an effect on the associated organ. Also, it was demonstrated that the person did not necessarily have to be physically in contact. In contact that can occur through a conducting um, element. It can produce a 
an effect on the person. It also showed that if it is less than five millimeters from the skin of the person, there was also th a therapeutic effect effects achieved. Now quickly, we'll describe Dr. Morel's work. Two milestones. Dr. Morel was familiar with Paul's electroacupuncture. In 1958, he proposed an experiment. He took no sod, which is a homeopathic condolution at the high concentration level, at the level of D30. This substance had been diluted um, consecutively many times to achieve a molecule above the Avogad Avogadro um, power. So this product doesn't necessarily have to be in contact with the patient, but even without having a molecule of the principal act, uh, of the active principle, a therapeutic effect was achieved. In 1975, he continued his studies and looked at changing the cable that linked the patient with the uh, product with using a system without cables, using electromagnetic wave transmitter, low power, that was in contact with homeopathic products. He found that the measurement on the um, medication um, showed the effect on the patient and extrapolated that information on this medication was related with a weak vi electromagnetic vibrations at low frequency and because it can produce physiological effects, these vibrations should, should be the same one as that used by the body. Electromagnetic um, um, transmitter, low frequency, they're able to provide information that's recognized by the body. The body knows and uses these electromagnetic frequencies. So the next step now is to use electromagnetic frequencies to regulate a body function. These were the original devices of that developed at that time. So the conclusion was that certain electromagnetic, uh, coherent electromagnetic vibrations of um, weak intensity acted as transporters of information, the theory of biophotons of Dr. Gall. There is a series of references at the end of this presentation, the end of the screen, you'll have all of the scientific um, uh, literature. In case you're interested, in 1977, the more equipment was developed. Dr. Morel had the following idea to use the patient's electromagnetic vibrations instead of the medication. You know that there's effect of external substances, and instead of using external substances, he decided to use the patient's own electromagnetic vibrations. He got in touch with um, Rash, Rashe, who developed the electro electronic device that's capable of uh, doing this. This is the schematic representation of the equipment. There is the um, oscillations that are introduced and the outlet of the oscillations. By resonance, maybe of two types, endogenous or exogenous. In endogenous by resonance, what we have is electromagnetic vibrations obtained from the patients using electrodes. The capacity may be total, one to 20,000 hertz, or um, frequency bands that are different. The effects can be measured um, rapidly using false electroacupuncture. The pathological vibrations are the electromagnetic manifestation of uh, physical pathologies, and um, we can work on the on these and changes of pathologies. Exogenous by resonance. Electromagnetic vibrations are used. They are external electromagnetic vibrations. Um, there are substances of diagnostic interest or therapeutic interest, such as um, allergens, vitamins, no sodes. We can also as determine patient's response to allergens, vitamins, or no sodes. These substances 
can also be stored electronically. That's, it is called electronic homeopathy. The native substances, such as food, for instance, are recorded, digitalized, and stored. Using an equipment, they're converted into an analogical oscillation for use in treatment. We can also use secretions of the patient. In our computers, we have up to 20,000 type of information, electromagnetic information that correspond to food, to drugs, to medication, etc. In 2007, the efficacy of this electronic homeopathy had been demonstrated in comparison to placebo. Changes were demonstrated and also certain changes were observed um, corroborated by results of uh, blood analysis. So we know that there are studies that also corroborate other studies that also corroborate the results and effects. This is the Mora equipment. These are the electrodes. They are applied on the patient. The patient is con in contact with the equipment. It's connected to the equipment. And this is the computer that we use. We have this um, digitalized and stored information on all of the different types of substances. According to the clinical studies and results published, best results are achieved for allergy and intolerance, not only in regard to diagnosis, but also in regard to treatment. This is a simple procedure. It is an effective procedure for psychomatic, psychosomatic diseases, functional diseases, metabolic disorders, treatment of chronic or acute pain, rheumatic problems, um, compromise of the locomotor system, chronic intoxication intoxication such as heavy metals, um, dental amalgams or pastes. Basic principles and basic principles used to develop the theory that led to the development of the Mora therapy. Briefly, I'll be focusing on certain paradigms. Max Planck, Nobel, uh, Physics Nobel Prize said that matter does not exist per se. All matter is formed for and is comprised of a force that put atom particles in vibration. Einstein said that we can consider matter to be that part of space where the field is extremely dense. Concerning um, bioelectromagnetism, all um, living beings have um, bioelectric um, magnetism. The structure and development of the organisms based on the non-material system waves. These fields of forces of life have the capacity to organize and form structures that are highly complex and form living beings. All organisms, living organisms, have complex electromagnetic fields. Here's another concept also, and based on the work of a, a Prigogini, Physics Nobel Prize. A subtle information such as a weak electromagnetic vibrations capable of um, activating programs of physiologic and or biochemical regulation that already exist in the body, although they are inactive. The body supplies the energy to execute the program. We only provide the information. The in, with the information, the process can be activated. Now, by resonance, just um, two comments from Dr. Smith, uh, therapeutic stimuli that enter with precision, in, that enter with precision in resonance with the body can act in a very short period of time, fractions of seconds, whereas some therapeutic stimuli that enter little by little or not at all, resonance of the body only act after prolonged time or sometimes several minutes. 
This is also a very interesting uh, comment. Doing much is no longer correct. Um, acting precisely and without side effects will lead to um, determination of the precise uh, spectrum of treatment applications. There have been different people have uh, promoted the development of new techniques for bioresonance. Um, sorry. Dr. Cornelissen, in 1988, started using morotherapy in 1988. In 1997, developed the system, the systemic diagnostic system. The systemic diagnostic system has to do with the emission of a frequency and we determine how the patient reacts to this. And we have um, extracorporeal and intracorporeal uh, substances. Resonance or passivity can only be the only outcome. It permits three different types of activities, and substance testing, quantification testing, and correlation testing. What does this mean, and how useful is this? The substance testing assesses the effect of a substance on the body, for instance, uh, nutritional supplementation, and to determine the effects. We can assess the interaction of that substance with the patient's electromagnetic forces. The results may be indifference, intolerance, it may be effective or it may be negative. Intolerance or effectivity, effectiveness. All of the preparations can then be um, prepared. But we have a quantification test so that we can determine a specific level for efficacy or toxicity of substance. What does this mean if I have a substance that has a positive or negative effect on, on, on a subject, an individual, and we can assess that, we can place a value to that um, to raise or reduce the effects and achieve the effects desired. This test is important, the correlation test. What does this mean? This allows us to associate pathogens with organs. One of the points of Dr. Cornelison has to do with an um, early diagnosis of toxicity. We can work on the bubble um, olfactory bulb. We can work on environmental toxins. Uh, let's take a patient for it for instance, that has sensitivity to a certain toxin and represent and also shows um, olfactory bulb problems or disorders. If there's a correlation, then these um, changes can show what will happen, what can happen later. Is there a way that we can measure, measure whether a certain substance affects a certain tissue and perhaps it makes it, but I'm not familiar with it. So that's the reason why I'm offering the bioresonance technique. Cornelison said that, uh, I mentioned uh, to Dr. Cornelison that I had the possibility to speak about bioresonance here, and he um, described the processes he used for treatment. In his own words, he said 60% of um, breast cancer, ovary, or uterus cancers can be avoided by um, being careful about environmental toxins and progesterone. And we should be um, careful about the cancerogenic effects of environmental toxins. And there is also an, an, a progesterone. We have a way to eliminate this using more a procedure. We can eliminate certain environmental toxins with program 77. We also have ways to um, eliminate heavy met metals, including viruses. This is the program. It's called Program 77. We can eliminate these environmental toxins very well. According to Cornelison, um, who's been using this program for 77 years, he has demonstrated that this program is highly effective. I will be showing you some transparencies later on in English concerning this issue. 
Now, what is important to take into account is how we can diagnose um, environmental stresses in the brain, for instance. And he says that we can only do it using the correlation test. Well, at least that we should take that into account. Here's a test. On the one hand, you have a group of stressors and a group of organs. The correlation test allows us to take a stress and compare it with an organ to determine if a correlation exists. For instance, in the gut. Is the gut being stressed by a pathology? Is it being produced by an environmental change? Is stress being produced by a virus? The Mora system allows us to treat not only chemical environmental toxins, but also physical toxins, electromagnetic vibrations, artificial or natural origin, until we can achieve the results desired. Now, this um, uh, is a slide uh, from Dr. Cornelison on the significance of the environmental toxins, its hormone effect. This is one of the main problems in the development of cancers. And once again, we must underscore that the environmental toxins can be only detected and evaluated by the moral diagnosis, not by conventional medicine. Are there other ways of doing that? Here are the effects of environmental toxins. I think this is very interesting. You have systemic effects that affect the entire organism through the mesenchyma, through systems and system. Then you have specific effects. And also you have the feature of um, lipo affinity. It affects the um, neurological tissue. It leads to all types of um, disorders, endocrine disorders. And you have a disorder of the hormone system as a result of predominance of the estrogen. And I um, estrogen active environmental toxins. The clinical case that was reported by Dr. Tinao, that was presented to Dr. Tinao earlier on, using the bioresonance um, equipment, we're able to obtain information on alkalosis, for instance, so we can determine how, how important it is in different tissues. Uh, we can determine the acid predominance or alkaline predominance at level of each tissue in different tissues in a very precise manner. We can determine also in which specific sites of the GI tract this occurs. That can be quantified according to each site. And we can determine also at following sessions what changes have occurred. We can also determine metabolism metabolic deficiencies of cholesterol, uric acid, and the tendency to develop ar arteriosclerosis. We can assess and inspect certain areas and correlate this area findings with different stresses. All of the information, the scientific information, scientific literature is listed here. That's also available in the handouts. And those of you who are interested, I can give you additional information. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.